Good morning, everybody. Welcome. I hope you had a great night. Uh, I'm Bruce Murphy from Insight Investment, and I'm hosting this session. Um, you're going to have to turn your minds now from um, sleep debt to the demography of debt. So uh, have a go at that and start just thinking about some questions because the uh, Q&A uh, questions, the AXA question machine will be up and going on your iPads. And um, just think about some of the impacts uh, of the gig economy, uh, the ageing demograph and the effect on public policy and a few things like that because you're going to hear more about that from Stephen Kinsella, our Irish economist, in fact with two PhDs who claims on his uh, bio that he makes sense sometimes. But uh, many of you will have heard his keynote and it's going to be uh, uh, very interesting and entertaining so looking forward to that. Um, so look, without any further ado, don't forget to get your questions going and I'll hand over to Stephen Kinsella. Good morning, everybody, and um, it's nice to see so many of you here this morning. And uh, thanks again to the organisers for a uh, chance to speak uh, at, at such an interesting event. I've learned a massive amount uh, in the last few days, and uh, I, I'm always really thankful uh, uh, for that. So, uh, very quickly, what do I want to talk about? Uh, I want to talk about debt and demography in particular. I want to talk about some research that I've done with uh, my hopefully soon to be former PhD student. Um, Apostolos Fasanos and some of his co-authors, um, but I'd also like to maybe place some of this stuff in an overarching kind of theory, a kind of a, a larger, maybe more global story um, for us all. So two main points, and, and, and it, it, this, is, this is something that it, it can be relatively counterintuitive, but it's probably correct. Debt does not matter, either the level or the rate of debt. It doesn't matter as long as A, you can service it from some kind of income somewhere, and B, someone is willing to give you more. This is crucial. Australian households probably know this at the genetic level at this point. But it's there. It, 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 it's a fundamental truth. When, any, when, when either of those two conditions are violated, as we'll see in a little while, things get messy. But uh, up to this point, debt levels or rates don't really matter. However, and you knew there was going to be a but uh, with such a rosy uh, uh, first point. Debt levels are very high in Australia, Ireland, the UK, the Euro area, uh, and interest rates are going up. And this implies increased fragility in the household sector in particular, in inc which, which translates almost immediately into political fragility, which then becomes a problem for business. Um, it also goes without saying that when you have a, a group of sectors like the household sector, the non-financial corporate, the financial corporate, and the rest of the world, and they're all dependent on one another deeply through the financial system, um, when one sector gets into trouble, it's very easy to, for the other ones to get pulled down, right? And I, I, of course, this is something that we should all be worried about um, uh, in, into the future. Okay, so here, here's, here's a, a chart that uh, uh, we put together, and it, it, takes, it takes a little bit of explaining. So this is four countries, well, three countries and a composite, Ireland, the UK, the US, and the Euro area. And what you're looking at here is a bar chart of the types of debt they have. On the left-hand side of each country is, 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 is a bar that shows the type of debt when the value of the assets are greater than or equal to the level of the debt. And on the right-hand side, it's where the assets are, the value of the assets are less than the value of the debt. So these are the different types of households, and these are taken from survey data. So this isn't, this isn't some imputed, you know, uh, uh, standard economist, lick your finger, stick it in the air, pray for the wind stuff. These are, this, is, this is survey data, and some of the data are interpolated. What you can see, if you look at the types of debt some of these countries have, they're, they're very different. So this is maybe, maybe the second major point I want to make. The debt types are very different by country. And, I, and I'll show you some Australian data in a minute, um, which won't surprise many of the people in this room, but if you just look at the differences, somewhere like Ireland, for example, relatively underdeveloped financial markets, basically most of its debt is in mortgages. Now this should not surprise anybody given that it just had a giant housing crisis. You know, it would be weird if that wasn't true. But you've got other collateral debt, you, you've got a little bit of credit card, you've got a little bit of overdraft and that kind of stuff. It's essentially a traditional old school, they spent too much money on property story, right? Now look at the UK. Look at the difference in the UK. So people, people who, have home, who have homes are doing pretty well, the value of their assets is 
greater than the value of their debt, they're in some kind of positive equity, happy days. Um, so other people who have other types of collateralized, non-collateral debt, they're doing okay. Um, but lots of people in the UK are, are underwater uh, for things like student debt, they're underwater for things like car loans, uh, particularly it's the, it's the fastest growing uh, type of debt in the UK at the moment, um, and, and credit cards, another really big problem in the UK, and, and payday loan lenders. Now look at the US. The US has the mortgage issue as well, but it also has student debt. Student debt in the US is absolutely astronomical. It's beyond anything really we can think about because student debt is effectively national debt, except it's not, except it is. I mean, we, we all know this morning that uh, President Trump did a deal to, to, to increase the debt limit for another three months with the Democrats. Um, which has to be ha have Republicans feeling a bit sore, but um, and I don't feel that terribly sorry for them to be perfectly honest. But uh, it, it is very interesting that were the universities and the students who, who come out of a BA in sociology at a community college with a hundred grand in debt, um, were they to say I am not paying this, there would be a very 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 strong pro pro possibility that the universities and the students would simply be bailed out by the state. So is that, is that really state debt? We don't know, we're not sure. It all depends on what happens later on. And in the euro area, you can see there's a, there's a kind of a, a, a mix. Now what's interesting about this is that if the types of debt are different, their, their, their structures are different. You can, of course, you can go to the people who own this debt and you can buy it off them. You can sell it to somebody else. You can wrap up mortgages and securitize them, collateralize them any way you want, and that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. The, the real point I want to make with this chart is that it's incorrect to treat every country as if it just had one type of debt. It doesn't. You have to be very careful with it. So this is the age structure of the Australian debt. So what you're looking at is households that are less than 30, households between 30 and 50, households 50 to 65, and households greater than 65. So it really shouldn't strike anybody as, uh, uh, as shocking, for example, to learn that people uh, who, who, who are less than 30 who have any debt, this is another very important point to this chart, not everyone has debt, um, but of the people who do have debt, you can see there, um, if you're between 30 and 50, 62.8% uh, 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 of those people have uh, housing debt, 31.7% uh, have uh, investment debt. Um, and it's really interesting, the student debt is a less than 30s problem. Now, that again, it, it, it's, a, it's an innovation in the, in the financial space, but what is really important to understand here is that these two things are connected. When you take out a debt contract for anything, it is effectively a claim on future resources. We all know this. But what is also true about that is everyone ages at one second per second. Unfortunately, this is also true. Uh, uh, it's happening right now. Maybe if you stayed in the bar too late, you might be aging at two seconds. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, uh, uh, maybe not. Let's see. Uh, but the, the really important point here is that th your debt ages with you and you need to pay it down. But the structure, the debt structure and the demographic structure are deeply, deeply related. And you need to pay attention to what's happening in the demographics and what's happening in the type of debt, right? So for example, if uh, the people who are in your funds, the members of your funds, if, if you happen to have a very young cohort, that's fine, maybe the demo demography is, is a different uh, uh, animal to somebody who has a fund whose members uh, have much older, uh, older membership, um, maybe with some uh, a, a DB and DC mixing, that kind of stuff, that's very interesting. Um, but then you have a different problem, you have a very different problem uh, uh, to the first pe type of people. Um, but it is certainly true that average debt levels are generally high, and they are generally high not only by category, not only by age category, but also by debt type. So if you're not making these kinds of distinctions and these kinds of connections, you're missing a crucial variable. And these things have not been that important um, historically, well not historically, but over the last 10 years. These things have not been that important. And the reason is interest rates have been incredibly low. So basically, if you had an income and you had some kind of prudential lender, and you match those two together, as long as the person kept earning that income and their household composition stayed roughly the same, they were going to service that mortgage or that debt or student debt or whatever it is. Um, 
that may change as interest rates change. So, just to give you a sense of what this looks like in the European context, and um, I actually sent some, the ABS data to uh, Apostolos. I just asked him to compute um, this particular figure. He now works for the Greek Ministry for Finance, so he has other stuff to do, <laughs> which he very politely told me, Steve, I've got stuff to do. I think he's working on the Estonian pension issue or something. Anyway, whatever. He's doing stuff. Um, but I, I, I want him to compute this for, 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 for Australia um, and for Canada, actually, because I think the, the same thing is true. So conditional on you actually holding some debt, and lots of people in society have almost no debt. Another very important point, really important point. Some people are either um, for, for religious reasons, uh, for temperamental reasons, for, for just history reasons, don't hold debt. They, they only deal in cash. That tends to limit their lifetime incomes, but it's you know there as a factor. You can see uh, here that the, the people aged 20 uh, to 80, uh, if you just look at the, the dashed line there for Ireland, um, people in my age bracket, uh, Oh, you know, <laughs> 200 times uh, debt income, right? Um, that, that is because in 2004, 5, and 6, people were, were able to get 10 times their income and 12 times their income for a three bed semi D. Um, I, I was telling some, someone a story about this recently. When I came back to UL in 2006 from New York, I, 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 I'd finished uh, school, finally <laughs> finished school. My dad was a taxi driver and he kept asking me after every degree, can you do anything? <laughs> and I would say, <laughs> no. <laughs> and then eventually he said, can you do anything? I said, well, I can teach dad. He went, fine, but whatever, that's okay. I got, this, I got the sense that he was, he, he was never that impressed about the whole thing. But um, can you do anything? Anyway, so, well, so I came back to Ireland and everybody was like, buy a house, 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 buy a house. They were, it was monomaniacal. Everyone said it. So I went to the bank and I, I, I said, oh, you know, can, I, can, I, um, can I see the bank manager, please? It was a, it was a bank on the campus. And uh, the, lady, the lady was like, uh, no, sorry, the, the bank manager's not here. Uh, you know, I, I left my card and said, look, I'll make an appointment later. And she came back. Uh, 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 I said, look, if, if, if she comes back later, give, give me a call. So I went back to my office, thought nothing, about, thought, thought nothing of it. And then, like, about an hour later, I got a <laughs> on the door, and it was the bank manager. She had come to my office to give me a mortgage. I had not been working there for a month. I didn't have a pay slip. She offered me 105% and 2,000 euros if I signed up today. Why? Because she was on a lending target. <laughs> she was really interested in that target, as, as, I, as I heard. Now, I didn't take the mortgage, but it wasn't because I had a PhD in economics, because I rang my dad, who's a taxi driver, and he was like, there's something wrong there, Steve. I said, yeah. <laughs> You're not wrong, Dad. You're not wrong. So fair play to my dad. He saved me a lot of money. Um, so, okay. Uh, that, that, that said, that said, Irish households got spectacularly indebted. Now, what is happening to the structure of this debt? It's not going away. There are not debt write-downs in, in, in the Irish scenario. Um, there, are, there are very, very few uh, 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 actual foreclosures. People are just sucking up the debt. Now, we can look at this from a financial perspective, but I'd, I'd urge you to think about this from a human perspective. Um, in, in, in 2012, the uh, uh, British Medical uh, Association did a huge survey of mental health in the UK and did all these tests. And one of them is called a cortisone swab. So they literally swab, uh, they get like a Q-tip and they, they swab the inside of your mouth and they test that for certain uh, chemicals. Uh, and one of them is, is a stress hormone. And uh, they, they were able then to see how much stress certain people were under. And they, what they showed was that people in the UK in excess debt, implying a debt service ratio of above 30%, unable to make really any meaningful repayments, um, were experiencing stress levels comparable to those experienced by people who had been through a war. And when you, you know, like, like, like that, there's, a, there's a deep psychological damage that goes along with being in excess debt. Um, and you can see, I think what you're going to see is as these stories play out, because again, those humps are going to just move along for the next 20 or 30 years. Remember, people in 2006 in Ireland were taking out 30-year mortgages. They're going to pay this stuff off in 2036, 2046, some of them, if they've got deferred payments. 
So the, the, these kinds of issues have huge macroeconomic effects. Of course, it's going to de de depress disposable income uh, for years to come. Of course, it's going to affect uh, uh, household formation for a long time. But anyway, uh, uh, these effects are more pronounced in Ireland because we were a bit crazier than everybody else. A lot crazier than everybody else, let's be honest. Uh, but then you can see in the US, it's, it's, it's smoother, but it's there. The UK and the Euro area has the same kind of uh, feature. And now what you see <clears throat> is that the median gross incomes of those with mortgages in Ireland are actually higher than those in the euro area, but the median mortgage loan term is actually higher. So they took out more, they took out more money for longer. Their income was higher, was higher, and they were kind of hoping that it was all going to work out. And again, the, the, these, these features track uh, uh, in, in degrees of severity, but across most developed countries. Now, here's some work that Apostolos did with some of his colleagues in the Central Bank of Ireland, and this is sort of a major point I really want to get through to everybody today. Um, here's what happens. We, they, they took the entire loan book in Ireland and they, they simulated a change in mortgage repayments. So they imagined what, happened, what would happen if interest, mortgage interest rates increased by 1% or 2%. So very small uh, uh, change. And what do you see? You see a 4% drop in the disposable income for uh, people between 30 and 40, um, similar uh, 40 to 50, and then it drops off, of course, for older households because they owe, owe less. But what's really interesting about this is for some people who can just about afford their mortgage, who can just about afford their credit card loans or their student debt or whatever it is, a 4% drop is a killer, right? And this is only a 1% or 2% change. If you're this fragile, and this is the entire household sector, by the way, if you're this fragile, the household sector starts getting into trouble, that becomes a problem for the banks, maybe they lose their job, that becomes a problem for you guys because they're not paying into, in, in, the, the employers and themselves aren't paying into the super. You know, this kind of stuff, it, it does have um, what you might call contagion effects, but also uh, um, uh, macroeconomic and, po and political effects as well. So I would just be very aware of this and I would urge you, if you, if you, if you have uh, uh, the resources, start trying to run a scenario like this. If you'd like, I'll give you the, the reference for the paper. Run a scenario like this on your own uh, books, in your own firms. If, uh, for, the, for your members, if their, their, their disposable income dropped by 5% or whatever, could they continue to make repayments? What would change? Maybe nothing. Maybe nothing. Um, but maybe something. It really might be well worth doing. So this is the first part of the, the story really is just to connect these two things of debt and demography and to show that when excess debt levels exist, people become fragile and they become extremely fragile at high levels of debt. And you don't want that happening either just for, for, for human reasons, but uh, uh, almost certainly you don't want it for um, uh, uh, business reasons either. Okay, uh, I love this chart because it scared the crap out of me. Uh, so this is net worth per adult plus the debt. You can see, uh, Denmark, Netherlands, Norway, okay. Two, one of those has a massive pension system and uh, 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 an another one is, uh, has a kind of you know, sovereign wealth fund. One of them is a crazy little island on the west of Europe and the other is Australia, you know? Uh, so net worth per adult and uh, uh, average household debt. It's uh, all a bit scary. And oh, there's Switzerland and we all know how normal they are. So. So I want to put this in a slightly larger context than the last sort of 10 minutes that I've got. So there's a, a, a guy called, from Threadneedle Capital called Toby Nangle. I urge you all to read his work. He's one of the most thoughtful people working in finance at the moment. Uh, Toby Nangle is just a, an absolutely brilliant, brilliant person. Um, and he's, he's somebody that I, 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 everything he reads, if he, if he wrote a cookbook, I would read it. He's that smart, he's that worth your time in reading. And there's another guy, you all know him, Charles Goodhart, he's a very, very famous mac macroeconomist. Both of them have basically restated the same thing in this, the same hypothesis. But because Nangle is young and not famous, and Goodhart is old and famous, I thought I'd call it the Nangle-Goodhart thesis rather than the Goodhart-Nangle thesis. Neither of them have called it this themselves because, frankly, if you, you know, if Stephen Kinsella calls something the Stephen Kinsella thesis, it's a bit naff. So I'm going to call it the Nangle Goodhart thesis. So here's the point. Here's the point. In the last 40 years, there's been a demographic sweet spot. 
in other words, the rising population uh, portion being of working age, and globalization, which I define here as the increased integration of factor markets, uh, and uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, this has cr resulted in the global glut of labor, an oversupply of workers depresses the relative price of labor, pushes down the labor share of national income in the vast, country, in the vast of advanced economies and depresses wage growth. Cheap labor reduces uh, the need for labor saving, productivity enhancing capital, uh, and that means there's a lower demand of, for capital and there's reduced natural interest rates. So this is not a QE story. This is not a, um, this is not a story about how the system itself connects uh, 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 together. It's not about uh, uh, workers being ripped off by capitalists or anything. This is a story that there are just so many people, so many young people, so many people in developed mar mar undeveloped markets willing to work for much less um, and willing to work harder for longer for less that actually this global glut of labor reduces real interest rates. And this has huge effects. So to sort of convince myself of the, the Nangle Goddard thesis, I went to the World Bank and I, I, I just averaged the entire population of the world, which is cool to be able to do, really, if you think about it. Um, so what you're looking at there is the average population uh, uh, across every country on Earth, uh, age 15 to 64. And you can see it kind of slides up there. And then the percentage change of that blue line is, uh, is, 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 is marked out on the right-hand axis. And what you see around 2002 is it goes negative. It goes negative for a couple of reasons. One is particularly uh, uh, about how China is aging. Another part of it is how Europe is aging. But most importantly, uh, the growth of what we might term the productive workers, uh, that is certainly changing and it's gone down. There is no uh, scenario in which it trends back upwards. Okay, So this demographic sweet spot thing is gone. Um, if one runs a pension fund, one should be worried about this particular graph, right? Now, it depends who's in your pension fund, obviously, um, but it's there. So um, how, does that, how does that resonate with the decumulation problem? So the good art and angle thesis says loads of people Im implies a depressed real and natural interest rate f for a long time. And when the second chart I showed you said, OK, there are not going to be a growth in younger people uh, in, in everywhere. Well, let's take Australian households and let's have a look at the, have a look at their you know their 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 uh, relative uh, 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 super contributions. So let's imagine you've got an income between nothing and you know let's let's call it four hundred fifty grand. There's a really good chance you, you will just end up becoming the state's problem. Uh, you know, let's imagine you live to be one hundred and ten, right? Uh, there's a really good chance you're going to be the state's problem. If, you, if you've got a really big pension pot, well, then you have a sequencing problem. And if you've got 1.5 million, well, you should be fine. But, you know, if you invest in some silly, silly banks and do some silly things, you could lose it all. In which case, whose problem do you become? The state. Now, I showed uh, you, you, you a chart before in, in my previous uh, 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 rant. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's, be, let's call a spade a spade, folks. All right. Um, and, and, and remember, <clears throat> this is the percentage of social expenditure from this data from the OECD as a percentage of GDP. And this is the average change in the Gini coefficient over the worst years of the crisis. You can see Ireland and Australia up there. At, at the top, you can see Italy, Spain, Greece, Portugal, uh, uh, um, uh, and some other countries down, and you know, Bulgaria and stuff down the bottom. You always want to be on the top. The welfare state is the it's the it's the it's the buffer. It's the it's also the engine of social progress. A lot of the time, every time you vote in a party that will re, that tells you to re, tells you taxes are going down and that means that's great, or uh, uh, you know uh, bangs the drum for more efficiency in public services and that kind of stuff. Uh, you know all of which I agree with on a semantic level. Um, what they're really asking you to do is move Australia from the top of that line to the bottom of that line. And when you do that, things will go badly. You really want a very, very developed welfare state, especially in conditions like those I've just described. And remember, if interest rates are very low, and they will be low-ish for a relatively long time, the welfare state should be able to invest seriously 
in upgrading its capacity to actually deliver some services. You really, really, really want that number to be as high as possible um, uh, for your own six, if, 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 if nothing else. Okay, um, I, I, this is another chart I, chart I showed last time. And I, 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 the more I've talked to people for the last three days, the more I've been impressed at, about how this gig economy thing is going to change uh, uh, the nature of what you do. I really believe this. I I, I, the, the fact that this is from the Oxford Internet Institute, their online labor index, um, I'd urge you all to have a look at it. One of the things they talk about is the need for a gig economy union to, for, to, to have some way to drive wages up. And I think that's really important. Um, if you guys can be agents of innovation in this area, I would urge you to think about how to do so. Because th the more you can do this, the higher average wages are, the more likely there will be decent contributions into your funds, the more solvent it will be, the more likely you are to stave off the decumulation problem. Um, that number is only going to go up. The only way you're going to make it not go up is if you lobby your senators to kill the gig economy off, in which case it will go somewhere else. It's not, it's not, this is a global trend. You can either grasp it and change it, or you can be harmed by it. Those are your only two choices. It's not the, the genie is out of the bottle, technologically speaking. You don't actually have a choice as to what you do with this. Okay? And I, I would urge you to embrace it and try to modify it as best you can uh, in order to help uh, workers and who will therefore help you. Okay. Right. Uh, I, I really like this picture. What you're looking at here is the labor share of income. So this is, in any year, let's say there's 100... Uh, uh, there's a hundred bottles of water. Uh, laborers get some of it, and capitalists get get the rest. Right? In the in the past, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, this amount was somewhere between 50 and 60 percent going to the capitalists, and the rest went to the workers. And now it's closer to 70, or sometimes even 75 percent going to the capitalists, and less going to the workers. I showed you some data last time saying the markups in in the 1970s were 18 percent above marginal cost, and now they're 67 percent above marginal cost. Happy days in the short term for you because it means the the equities that you're investing in are going up. Uh, but worse for you in the long term because this is depressing average wages. Okay, so have a look. Developing countries is effectively the wage share is constant. It's somewhere between 60 and 70 percent. And then for developed countries, after 1990, it just slides off. It absolutely slides off the table. This is a very bad thing, really bad thing. You can see the difference, and a lot of it has to do uh, with the Nangle Goodhart thesis. Have a look at average wages. Again, this is OECD data. Labor productivity has exploded. Real wages have stayed on the ground. Um, you can look at this, the, the, this change, uh, the share in, in all the G20 countries. Labor share fell in every single one of them, except Russia. If I know one thing about Russia, it's don't really look at their macroeconomic data as if it's sacrosanct. So maybe that number isn't the best. I wouldn't be betting my house on it. What are the results of the Nangle Goodhart thesis? Lower inflation, weaker wage growth, lower investment, falling real rates, light rising inequality. This is a massive problem. Okay? Uh, don't, believe, don't take my word for it. Read Nangle's work. Read Goodhart's work. He's a great paper uh, with um, a guy called Pradhan uh, uh, on this, which, which explains it all. This is uh, uh, straight from the OECD, um, and it's, it's a, you know, sort of a 25-year uh, uh, panel. Um, and, and here you can see, essentially, again, looking at the labor share and looking at the Gini coefficient, when the labor share goes down, workers get poorer, inequality rises, real interest rates go down. There's, there's, there seems to be a causal connection here, and it's very, very important to uh, consider. So um, this looks like a stable relationship. Could you get fragility from this? Could this, could this fragilize the system? Well, the answer is, of course. Here are, here are uh, uh, some charts from the latest, um, the latest IMF uh, 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 monitor, and what you can see is uh, we're in a debt trap. Every advanced economy has too much debt. Uh, we, we can kick the can down the road with low interest rates, and we have. We've kicked it so hard and so far, it's unlikely there's a can left, to be perfectly honest with you. There's been rapid depreciation of that can. But What's really important to understand is in the major developed economies of the world, like Australia, 
these lines are not going down. They're going, they're either going up or they're leveling off. And then you have to ask yourself a question. When we come to the end of this cycle, what happens, right? What happens? Um, and I would be worried about that. Uh, and I would urge everyone to think carefully about its implications. Ooh. Summary. So, what do I do, Stephen? Number one, shift out of debt-laden areas like housing if you can once interest rates start to rise. This sounds counterintuitive. It's like, hang on a second. If I'm going to start making money off this, I should stop having it on my books. It's like, yeah, especially if, 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 if you're fragile like that. Or invest in anti-cyclical recovery tools. Maybe, it, maybe there are policies you can sponsor which can help uh, poorer households out of debt. Maybe there's uh, uh, innovative products you can, you can build, insurance tools you can use um, that can actually help uh, uh, households get themselves out of debt. Maybe vulture fund work is, is, is a good way to go. But whatever happens, be prepared for large losses. I've asked many people around, the, uh, 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 around this uh, conference, can you sustain a 50 to 60% drop in your funding? Uh, uh, if some big shock comes along. And uh, I'd like you to answer that question, um, but not openly. Uh, go back to your firms and, and then answer uh, uh, it for yourselves. And if the answer is no, if you, if you, can't, uh, if you can't figure that out, um, uh, then maybe you should make some changes. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Steve. Very interesting presentation. Um, I'll pick up on a, a few factors uh, from the questions and please put more through and we have a roving mic as well if there's any from the floor. But just to kick off on the theme of inequality, it's obviously quite disturbing you know, looking at some of your numbers there. And um, you know, the, the real question is are we getting back to this pre-industrialisation level of unfairness for the worker and, and how, how will we see it play out in terms of wages rising and will it be achieved? Well, so one thing that's really important to understand when you look at labor share numbers in particular is that the pie itself has been has been getting bigger. So we, 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 we you know we slice the labor share into workers and capitalists, and some person gets thirty percent, some person gets seventy percent, whatever. But what's really important to understand is the pie itself is growing. So uh, you know, would you rather be a worker in twenty seventeen or nineteen seventeen? Obviously, the answer is twenty seventeen, because. You, you know, we have all this extra stuff, we have much higher standard of living, et cetera, et cetera. Economic growth has given us the, 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 the tools in which to live a better life. But what is certainly true is that there is a massive difference between somebody uh, who's, who's in, say, the fourth decile of the income distribution and somebody who's in the ninth uh, decile of the income distribution. And that, that difference has grown over time. And to the extent that that is socially corrosive, um, and politically corrosive, uh, that, that, that's an issue. But m most importantly, if, if you look at it from a, from a macroeconomic stability perspective, it's not stable either. I mean, if you look at, look at, the, the, look at the recent turmoil in the US, um, look at the kinds of reactions that you're seeing in the UK. Uh, 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 the more unequal societies uh, uh, that exist, the less likely they are to be coherent when uh, large shocks um, Take them over. Right, okay. Um, don't forget as well to rate the session while you've got your iPads out. Um, it's important to get the feedback. Um, so, look, the other topic with interest rates so low, you know, is, is it rational to be saving to buy a house or a car? And, um, and if it's irrational, then you know, how do we stop the merry-go-round? Well, so, so, so let, me let me, that's a really good question. Let me, let me think about it in another way. With interest rates so low, why shouldn't I negatively gear a house in Sydney, right? And just, you know, throw a lot of money into it and rent it out, hoping for an equity uplift. Because effectively, the cost of money is pretty low. Um, you can fill it up, you can, you can get a nice house, nice-ish house, and just kind of hold it and flip it eventually, right? With, when interest rates are this low, um, my, my worry is lots of people become speculators that were never speculators before. Um, during the boom in Ireland, uh, it was not uncommon to get a, to get a cab ride somewhere and some, the taxi driver tell you about his second property in Bulgaria, do you know? And you're thinking, well, mm. is that really what you, is that, you know, do you, I have no problem with taxi drivers owning houses in Bulgaria. Um, my, my issue is, do you know what you're doing? And the answer is, obviously not, 
right? Uh, I wonder, does that taxi driver still have the house in Bulgaria? Um, and so uh, we, the, the idea about uh, uh, buying cars and that kind of stuff, is it irrational? No, but what you are seeing, and particularly in the UK, I don't know if, if it's like this in, in Australia, what you are seeing with interest rates being so low, uh, car companies are actually turning into banks. They're actually offering you interest-free uh, 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 higher purchase agreements. They're saying, you know, come take the car. You're going to have a free car. Um, you pay 500 pounds a month or something for a BMW. You have to put six grand down, and then after two years you, or three years, you give it back to us, and we give you a brand new one. Just give us another six grand. And people are going, is that real? It's true. It's an actual fact. And people are buying these things, and you know that that's really interesting. And you're watching people swan around in brand new Mercedes and stuff, and you're thinking, this is just a symptom of the thing that happened 10 years ago. Mm. And it's some of the same people too. Well, you are driving in a nicer uh, quality of cab, in fairness. But uh, I, 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 I've, I've always been of the opinion that if you, if, you look at, if you think about the interest rate as the cost of money, right, the price of money, and the interest rate is incredibly low, then the cost is cheaper and people will act accordingly. But that, it's not like buying a Mars bar because you're buying something that, w that effectively commits you and future versions of you for a long time potentially into the future. And a lot of people aren't aware of this. I think there's a financial literacy problem in general across the developed world. Um, they're not aware of this, and they're also not aware of the penalties because they're quite short-term in their thinking. Mm. Okay, thank you. Is there any questions from the floor? Yes, uh, over, he over here. Hi, um, I was just wondering if if you've got this declining share of national income which is going to labour and a lot of governments around the world are talking about cutting corporate taxes, is that just a time bomb that they're creating? Because the electorate's going to get pretty pissed off. Yeah, I mean, if you're... So that's a really good question. Uh, to be honest, I don't... Uh, I happen to come from a country with a 12.5% corporation tax rate and, to be, and if you found a, con a company that actually paid 12.5%, they, you, you, you'd be shocked, to be honest. Um, any company of any size has enough accountants to not be able to, to, to avoid a lot of that, um, uh, uh, as, as Apple found out. So um, uh, corporation taxes are funny because they're, they've, they've been going down steadily for 30 years, and it's unclear what, uh, what, what where in the rankings of... Um, of, uh, of priorities the corporation tax sits, in particular with respect to foreign direct investment. So for example, um, may, many people use corporation tax as a hedge to actually get uh, uh, multinationals and multinational investment located in their country, particularly small open economies. Um, and they say, oh, we'll, we'll have very low corporation tax to get you in. But actually, most of the time, the companies are actually locating there for um, access to markets and access to human capital. And really, the, the corporation tax is like a, a carrot to get them there. So it's unclear how much of a controlling variable it is. But what is certainly true is you've got households paying, you know, between their income taxes, their VAT, uh, their super, their water charges, uh, and every other thing that's going out of their, 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 their incomes. If you've got them paying something like 50 to 60 to 70 percent of their disposable income on, 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 on all that stuff, and then they look at uh, corporations who have never, ever, ever made more money, and the corporations are saying, you guys need to work harder, that's not sustainable in the long term. That's really not sustainable in the long term. Cutting corporation taxes, uh, as they're talking about in the US, they're talking about it in the UK, um, they're talking about it everywhere, really. Um, it, is, it is a short-term fix, but long-term, I think it's quite damaging. Long-term, I think it contributes to the, the features that I, I saw there. And I would be quite worried about it. Um, I wouldn't like to go back to a situation in the 1970s where there was like 70% corporation tax in some areas. Um, but moving it up, having a flat corporation tax of 20% across the OECD, for example, I think that would be amazing. You know, People will go, oh, this is terrible. Prices are going to go up. Uh, it won't. It just won't. It just won't happen. How do I know that? I've looked at their operating surpluses. They're grand. They'll be. They'll just. They'll. They'll suck it up, and then the state will. Uh, the, the state will have that money to spend. Um, they'll increase that level of social expenditure. The issue has to be coordination. In a globalized system, 
it's easy for company A to move from Luxembourg to Belgium or Ireland to Australia or something like that. It's actually very easy for, for a large company to do that. Um, they can even, even with manufacturing, it's very easy to do that. So it has to be the case um, that you, you levy it across the system so that they can't arbitrage between jurisdictions. Um, there is a, uh, an OECD program called the Base Erosion Profit Sharing Scheme, uh, the BEPS process. Um, I really, really hope that it comes to some conclusion. Um, there's also a common, consor common consolidated corporate, corporation, corporate tax base. Common consolidated corporate tax base. It sounds like a Catholic child with catechism. You know, yeah. Uh, bless me, Father, for I've sinned. You know, corporate tax base. Yeah. You know, all that. And uh, yeah, it's been 900 years since my last confession. But anyway, um, uh, uh, <laughs> it probably has. Anyway, um, uh, uh, that idea of uh, just having one set of rules that are very simple and inviolable. But that implies that all of these countries get together and agree on it. Um, that's Thomas Piketty's uh, argument as well, by the way, um, and many other people would have suggested the same. It seems to me to be the only way out, but I think things have to get a little bit worse before that becomes a viable policy prescription. Just on the topic of taxes, we've talked about corporate tax, but you know we've got a lot of saving going on in an ageing demograph. And you know, is there an argument that there should be higher tax rates to to try and start to redistribute some wealth back via government spending? Yeah, I mean, millennials. Uh, I, I actually so so what I think here is imagine a situation where people can gift some of their money relatively tax efficiently. That would help intergenerational transfers, and that would free up those savings uh, a little bit. I, 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 I'm skeptical of the, um, the in macroeconomics, there's a sort of standard count that savings is always equal to investment, and I think that's probably not true in the short term. It's probably not true when you can do things like move money to Antigua and you know uh, uh, the Cayman Islands and Ireland and places far flung, you know glamorous destinations like that. Um, so uh, I, I, I'm, I'm uh, very skeptical uh, uh, about, about that. And if it's the case that you'd like to free up savings, you can use policies to do that. But they have to be tax-based policies. They can't be interest rate-based policies because interest rates are so low. Mm -hmm. OK. Any more questions from the floor? Um, just take one at the back there. Yep. Yeah. Um <laughs> In Australia, since probably the 1980s, there's been a dramatic drop in union density. Probably from the 90s, there's been labour laws introduced that have, I guess, weakened the power of, of unions to be able to uh, pursue wage claims across industries. Um, do you think there's a direct correlation between the drop in union density and low wage growth? and hence higher household debt? So uh, here the answer is yes, and it's unequivocal. Um, there was a paper published in, in uh, the American Economic Review, uh, it's one of the best journals in the world, uh, very recently showing this exact thing, this exact correlation. In fact, one of the slides I showed in my first presentation showed this, that um, as union representation fell, the labor share fell concurrently. Um, and I, uh, it is a really interesting factor um, that uh, unions were derided as this kind of, you know, agent of inefficiency. But actually, what they what they what they seemed to do was co keep aggregate demand higher by increasing real wages. That, of course, caused a bit of inflation, which is very good if you're uh, uh, if you happen to be up to your necks in debt. Um, so, so you know, again, another another little bit of inflation wouldn't be the worst thing for the developed world, but it's not looking like it's going to come from anywhere um, because of this, su such an open economy. But uh, would I like to see a return to sort of 1970s levels of union representation? Probably not. But do I think Uber workers need a need a union? Absolutely, no doubt they they do. Um, like I, I'm a union member, and, and, and uh, uh, but I'm also a public sector worker. Right. I don't know if I was working in a bank, would I be a union member? Because you'd stick out. Right. So, so maybe uh, a lot of this is down to the unions as well. Right. The unions themselves have not been proactive enough. I haven't seen it, uh, any particularly innovative suggestions uh, about how to, how to grapple with the gig economy or particularly uh, in finance uh, just yet. Um, but I, I, I just fully agree and the research unequivocally backs this up that um, 
you, you, when, particularly when you have financialization, which is the growth of financial services, um, you tend to have a huge drop in union representation that has to have some negative impact on real wages. Another from the floor. Um, it's great that you are complimenting Toby Nangle. He's very good. Uh, I agree with you. I don't work for Threadneedle, by the way, but he's an excellent guy. Did you, did you hire him? Uh, I would hire him if I could. I honestly would. I think he's really, yeah, really fantastic. Good. He's top shelf. <laughs> And, and young too, so he's got a long way to go. Um, the, the question is, uh, we've had uh, over 30 years, we've had declining labour share and rising profit share, and we've also had falling interest rates. So you get, the, as an asset owner, you get the combination of uh, higher and, uh, better and better discount rates on a higher and higher profit share. Yep. Um, are you making the call that the labour share now goes sideways, it backs up, and therefore the profit share comes down and therefore investment returns will not be particularly strong because of that combination. Um, and I just would add, as you, as you would know, Toby's making this call that places like Japan uh, will so very soon see wage increases of quite dramatic uh, yeah. magnitude, um, but will probably be unable to pass it on, so they get squeezed, i.e. The net wash of some of the comments you're making is that equities are in for a tough period. Yeah, and I, in fact, so, so so I agree with everything you just said there. And in fact, that was the last thing I said in my in my first rant uh, that equities are in for a squeeze, genuinely, because it, it, I I fully expect there to be a moment in which people just say, "Hang on, this is this process has gone too far. We need to change it." it you will probably see it in Japan. You might even see it in the U.S. You might even see it in the U.S. You might, you might see real wages coming up in the US, more for political reasons than anything else. Um, but this will have exactly the effect uh, that you're talking about. But uh, do I think the, pro I, 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 you gotta remember just how f far up the, 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 the gap between zero and one the profit share is. Like you'd want to have the profit share fall quite considerably for returns to drop that far, right? So for example, uh, if, if, if it's the case that the markup over marginal cost is 67%, right, and you drop that to 60%, say, and you give that 7% to the workers, who will all go, hooray, and it'll be brilliant, and they'll go out and buy stuff, and there's nice multiplier effects, uh, which we all know now after the crisis are pretty high, so we all know that'll spur active demand, we'll get some growth, happy days. I don't think that anybody looking at that company that just went from 67% markup to 60% is going, this is a dog, we need to get rid of this. Rid of this. So I think, I, I think there's, a, there's a channel of sort of, a channel of reasonableness, if you like, between which people go, okay, right, the workers are getting some money, that, that's probably okay. Equity returns are a bit lower, but they don't tank, they just slide off a little bit. But what you'll also see at the same time, don't forget, you've got two other big changes. One is cultural change, the nature of work is changing, but the other is technical change, technological change. So those things might buoy returns in other areas, and you've got monopoly rents. So some new companies are going to create new markets that'll, that by definition they will be monopolists in and you will get massive equity growth, massive, massive operating surplus growth and therefore equity return uh, in them. So I, so I think if you take all of those things together, I think the, 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 the outlook is still good, but I don't think the outlook for equities is, is as solid as it was in the last 10 years. Thank you. Now, before I go back to the floor for another question, the most liked question online, do you think neoliberalism is the main cause of low wage growth? Yes. Back to the floor. <laughs> the, the re so, so, think about the big ideas, right? Um, the big idea after the war was we'll use the state to heal our problems, right? It was called Keynesian economics, whatever, but it was like, we're going to do that. And then that kind of ran out of steam at a, after about 1970. People seem to forget that when Keynes was writing in 1936, the government expenditure in the UK as a share of uh, total output was like 15%. So when he said, I want you to double the size of the government, he went, I want you to go from 15 to 30, which was a huge expansion. Right now, what's the government as a share of GDP is like fifty to sixty percent in most countries. You cannot double that, you know. And you can nationalize everything, but that's people won't. People pretty much won't like that. You can increase it by two percent to three percent. The state, the state is no longer the solution to everyone's problems. It's that big thing that I showed before. Um, what is true uh, is that after the nineteen seventies. 
the idea of deregulating, getting rid of, get, uh, integrating asset markets, uh, getting rid of uh, labor unions and all that kind of stuff, um, that, 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 that idea has now run its course. It ran its course in 2007. Um, you might call that story a financialization story, but it's there, right? That the, the idea, and I, by the way, for me, the word neoliberal is not some pejorative, you know? It, it's, just, it's, it's just a particular set of ideas around how markets should function in primacy over the state. Um, and that, that, that sort of ran its course. And then for the last, you know, 10 years, we'd all be going, fuck, you know, uh, make, you know, keep it all together. And that's happened, as I showed you in, in the first lecture. We're kind of back to where we were. We've got over that. There's no big idea to replace the neoliberal idea. What's our idea now? The big idea is populism, right? Oh, give people stuff. What stuff? Any stuff. That stuff, you know? Populism is a fiction. It's the fiction that the constraints that bind those in power now won't bind me when I'm in power. Right? That's a populist. Every populist makes the same claim. I will change things for you. Most populists fail um, unless they do ridiculous things like start wars and stuff, and please God, they won't. So uh, we're still looking for this big idea, and I really don't want this big idea to be AI or you know, something like that. I think that would be a disaster, uh, frankly. I, would wa I want the big idea to be something else. Um, and uh, if there are any suggestions as to what this big idea was, uh, I'd happily steal them off you and win the Nobel Prize. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any more from the floor? No? Okay. Um, you, you made the comment in your presentation that um, the glut of labour uh, is the cause of this persistent low interest rate environment. So we've got an ageing demographic, so um, you know, arguably you said that was over. But what about the impact of robotics? So we, you know, does that mean we're just going to have this persistent sort of productivity increase and glut of labour? So um, there's been really good work by Darren Ajamoglu of MIT. Uh, and he looked at, the, at, at manufacturing robotics uh, over a 30-year period in the US in certain cities. And he, he actually was able to figure out what the job loss was for ma in, in, the, in those specific sectors like car manufacturing and stuff. And for every one robot, six and a half jobs were lost in those sectors. So when you think about that for a second, you go, okay, that's, okay, expand that out from manufacturing now to services, um, to healthcare, expand it out to, um, you know, stuff like this. Maybe none of us are in a room next year. We're all just screens staring at each other from our bedrooms or something. Um, I don't know. There'd be less pants, which is maybe good. I don't know. But we wouldn't get to have this, this lovely place and ha have the chat, um, which is maybe bad. So uh, is it going to cause... I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm very skeptical of the robots will lead our jobs thesis because of the six and a half jobs that were destroyed, loads of new ones were created by building the robots and servicing them and so forth. The problem was the people whose jobs were lost were not the people who got the new ones, and those are the people who voted for Donald Trump, right? Yep. So, how do you, so it's not necessarily an economic problem because the, the economy creates more jobs than it destroys in every technological re revolution. If any of you are interested in this, there's an amazing economist, her name is Carlotta Perez, and she's written uh, brilliant articles on the influence of new technologies on, on, on society. She's gone all the way back to the Industrial Revolution. Fantastic economist. Um, so her work really convinces me that it does create more jobs. The question is, whose jobs and where? It, when, when, in any, any policy change, economics teaches you that there are winners and losers, and the winners could compensate the losers, but they never do. In reality, the losers never get compensated f for any technological change. And if the, big, if the gap is too big, in other words, if the hysteresis, if the, the, the amount of unemployable labor gets too high, that becomes a political problem. And how do you solve that? Using the welfare state. Well, if the welfare state isn't there, Who's going to say, I will fix your problems? Some demagogic populist. I don't think we want one of those. I think they're, they're, they're at the very least, they're bad for business. Mm, okay. And I guess it points to the need for people to be able to adapt and change and, and a training basis or, or structure to, to yeah. help that facilitate. It, it actually all comes down to a plea for more education and better types of education. But when I say education, yeah. I don't mean more people doing PhDs in economics, because um, <laughs> that would create a labor supply, oversupply. You, know, I don't want, you don't want a glut of economists. Um, 
God, can you imagine that? That'd be a disaster. Um, years ago, we tried to come up with a collective noun for economists, you know, like a murder of crows, you know, a flock of sheep, and we saw like a gloom of economists. Be a good collective noun. But no, the idea, <laughs> really, it's just, we're a depressing bunch. No, the, the, the idea of, of proper further and higher education together so that you actually get people who can, you know, who can do things unlike me, who can do things, right? Um, but also who can, who can come through and, and, and actually adapt to change. You need those things. And for that, you need a properly educated workforce. And if you're, you know, if you're reducing spending on early childhood and primary education, secondary education, and, you know, and you're voting in governments that do that, you gotta say like, why am I doing that? Like that doesn't make any sense either in the short term or the long term. Mm -hmm. Time for one more from the floor. Okay, uh, yes. Um, Stephen, just a final uh, question and probably do you have a message of hope from the Irish economy for Australia and can you answer, has your dad paid off his mortgage uh, or is he now caught in the gig economy and working for Uber? So, so it's really interesting, um, unfortunately my dad passed away a couple of years ago, but um, uh, he was a taxi driver. Um, uh, so he was kind of always in the gig economy, and uh, he kind of brought this home to me one day. I, I was I was in college and I was I was doing an essay and I couldn't kind of get it, and uh, I couldn't get my you know my head around it. And uh, I said, Dad, Dad, what? Dad, I've got a problem. What's your problem? I think I've got writer's block. And he went, I don't get fucking taxi driver block. <laughs> get on with it. And I went, you know, and I've never had writer's block since. So that's helpful. Um, no, so he he didn't. He, so so uh, you know he was in the gig economy. You know many 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 years before, uh, many many years before before it was fashionable. He was sort of a gig economy hipster, I think, in a way. Um, and uh, yeah, no, he he taught me a lot about that stuff. But uh, no, he he didn't get involved in any of that kind of stuff. But uh, I think he was from a different era, so he he, he thought in a, he thought about it in a different way. Great. Okay. Well, um, thank you, Stephen. Um, you did a good thing today. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.